started. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society's virtual event with Dr. W. Keith Campbell, author of the book, The New Science of Narcissism, Understanding One of the Greatest Psychological Challenges of Our Time and What You Can Do About It. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to let you know about some other exciting upcoming speakers we have scheduled for this week. Tomorrow evening, Lincoln historian and author Richard Streiner will be joining us to talk about his latest book, Summoned to Glory, The Audacious Life of Abraham Lincoln. Then on Wednesday, author Stephen Heyman will be joining us to discuss his new book, The Planter of Modern Life, Lewis Bromfield and the Seeds of a Food Revolution. Join us to learn the story of how a leading writer of the 1920s became America's most famous farmer and inspired the organic food movement which took place here in the state of Ohio. For more information or to register for any of our events, please visit our website at hudsonlibrary.org. I would like to let everyone know that tonight's program is being aired on Zoom and the Hudson Library's Facebook page. We will be accepting audience questions during the second half of tonight's program. And at any time, please feel free to leave your questions. If you are on Zoom, you will see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can submit your questions. If you're on Facebook, please leave your question as a comment and we will try our best to add them to tonight's list. Now, I would like to uh, take some time to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Campbell is a professor of psychology at the University of Georgia and is a nationally recognized expert on narcissism, society, and generational change. In addition to his book, he has also written The Narcissism Epidemic and also When You Love a Man Who Loves Himself and more than 120 peer-reviewed articles. His work on narcissism has appeared in USA Today, Time, and the New York Times. He's also made numerous radio and television appearances, including the Today Show and NPR's All Things Considered. Dr. Campbell holds a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and his postdoctoral work was completed at Case Western University here in Ohio. Copies of Campbell's book, The New Science of Narcissism, right here, is available for purchase courtesy of Hudson's own local independent bookshop, The Learned Owl. We will provide a link in the chat for easy access to purchase. And now, without further ado, please join me in providing a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Keith Campbell. Thank you. Dr. Campbell, go ahead and take it away. Hmm. Thanks for that nice introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I've forgotten how long it's been since I was up in Cleveland, Ohio, in the basement of the psych building at Case Western, but that's actually um, where a lot of the ideas I'm talking about started, was kind of a basement office down there with a, with a few other postdocs. But it's nice of you to have me this evening. Um, I'm going to talk about narcissism, and what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of a background of the topic and maybe some of the different ways we think about it in psychology. It's a little more complicated than most people think about it, and then talk about some of the ways narcissism manifests itself in the world, um, and then just take whatever questions you have and happy to talk about just about anything. So... To start, narcissism is a term that's it's used a lot, and I think a lot of people use it and aren't quite sure exactly what it means. It's usually used pejoratively. It's not, you don't want to be called a narcissist. And people usually mean it's selfish or self-centered, and, and that's part of it. But our definition in, in psychology is a, more, a little more complicated. So when we talk about narcissism, we really are talking about three different three different constructs or three different ideas and the first of these is a personality trait meaning we're all at some level of narcissism from high to low and has to do with the combination of having a positive view of yourself having high self-esteem but also having a sense of entitlement feeling that you deserve special treatment that you're better than others and sometimes what goes with that is energy and enthusiasm and maybe even charisma or drive so when you have a combination of somebody who's a little self-centered, but also extroverted and charismatic and outgoing and sometimes charming, we talk about this as grandiose narcissism. So if you think about, uh, you know, the, the Iron Man, Tony Stark character in the Marvel movies, he's kind of this more grandiose narcissist character, a bit of an exhibitionist. And, and some of these folks are a little more stern and authoritarian, but it's, but it's one form of narcissism that we see, and, and the grandiose form is, you know, what you see in politicians and actors. It's, it's much more common. 
There's another form of narcissism that people aren't quite as aware of, and this is a combination of a sense of entitlement and thinking you're special, just like grandiose narcissism, but also having low self-esteem and being a little insecure. So imagine that you think you're better than people, um, but no one really understands that. No one sees how great you are because you're a little shy. And so maybe you go into therapy because you're you know, depressed or anxious, and it turns out you're a little bit self-centered. And so this is a form of narcissism that we often talk about as vulnerable narcissism or covert narcissism because it's hidden or hard to see, basement narcissism. There's different words for this. So you have these two forms of narcissism out there, one that's sort of more grandiose and in your face and driven and outgoing, and the other that's more vulnerable and shy and, and you know, easily threatened and gets defensive quite easily. And that's more vulnerable form of narcissism. And both of these things are tra traits and you can have, be high on both or low on both or whatever. And then there's this third form of narcissism, which is the clinical disorder of narcissistic personality disorder. So sometimes when people are saying narcissism, they're talking about a clinical disorder. So narcissistic personality disorder is a combination of extreme narcissism, grandiose narcissism, and some vulnerability. So somebody who has a very high opinion, a need for admiration, a trouble, trouble with having empathetic or caring relationships with other people. And what happens to make narcissism and disorder is that it becomes extreme, so you're very narcissistic. But in addition to that, narcissism becomes inflexible. So the way a personality works ideally is maybe you're, you know, you're doing a TV gig, you gotta be a little self-promotional, but then you go home and you gotta be a little more relaxed, a little less self-promotional, maybe focus on your family. But if you're stuck on focusing on yourself, it gets you into trouble. So you get this extreme and flexible form of narcissism that has some sort of impairment. So if you're narcissistic and it's ruining your relationships because your marriage becomes dysfunctional because you're so selfish, or maybe you can't interact with your kids well because you're so controlling, um, maybe, it, maybe it starts to interfere with your decision making because you're so you think you're so infallible in your decisions that you take risks and you fail repeatedly and lose your money. Um, maybe it makes it, it has problems at work. Whatever the case is, if narcissism is extreme and has problems that are clinically significant, it can be diagnosed as a disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. So again, three forms of three three forms of narcissism out there. Two traits: grandiose narcissism. That's most of what we're thinking about. This more vulnerable narcissism, which is what you see more in in clinical settings and counseling, and then this clinical disorder, which is relatively rare. You're talking one or 2% of the population at any time might have it. Um, they're all similar, they're all related, but they're all a little bit different in how they're used. So what makes narcissism interesting are a few things, but one thing in, uh, in particular from the psychology realm is that narcissism is, is somewhat special in, in terms of personality traits that involves a lot of what we call self-regulation. So imagine, you know, you think you're a 10 and you're really a seven. You're, you think you're 10 in looks, you think you're 10 in intelligence, you think you're 10 in people skills, leadership, but you're really a seven. So what do you do? Well, it's, it's interesting. You have to go out and get attention for things that are good. You have to seek attention. You have to brag, you have to show off, name drop, so if you're narcissistic, you say, oh, yeah, let me tell you about the cool people I was hanging out with this weekend. You might be materialistic. So you say, hey, look at me. Here's my car. My car is great. So I'm great. Um, you might bring conversations around yourself. You might find a group of people who follow you, a posse or a, you know, a group of friends or hanger honors who always give you positive feedback. And so what you end up doing with your life is in order to keep your ego a little bit inflated, a little bit expanded, you have to change how you engage with the world. And when you do this and it works, it, you feel pretty good. So if you get, a, you, know, you get a hot car and a hot girlfriend and you can get people to believe you're really special, at some point you can fake it till you make it a little bit and, and narcissism really works. 
And other times, if you can't really pull it off, if you don't have the skills, if you're, if you're not that clever, um, your narcissism makes you look a little foolish and, 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 it, and it doesn't work as well. But narcissism is interesting because it has all those social aspects to it. And because of that, you see narcissism sort of manifest in, in these different important aspects of life. And there's lots of research on all these things. So um, one that people think about a lot are close relationships, romantic relationships, where narcissism comes in there is that people who are narcissistic, more grandiose, are often very attractive. I mean, interpersonally attractive because they're confident, they're they're charismatic sometimes, they're likable when you first meet them. We have research where you look at how attractive people are in 30 seconds or 60 seconds and narcissists are more attractive. So what happens in relationship is you have this interesting pattern where people who are narcissistic are very attractive as partners in the short term, very exciting. And then in the longer term, um, the relationships become dysfunctional because you know, you're dating somebody who's narcissistic and you're waiting for the love and affection and, you know, desire for emotional intimacy. And instead of that, the person's like looking for somebody better looking than you and it falls apart. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a really complex mess for relationships. Um, another area where narcissism has gotten a lot of attention, a lot of interest is in social media for obvious reasons, I think, when you think about it. But what social media does is it allows us to broadcast ourselves, just like a Hollywood movie studio did in 1928 or 35 or whenever they were doing it. So that's why we call it YouTube and your iPhone. And it's all about projecting yourself. So what we find in the research on social media is that people who are narcissistic have more followers on social media, more friends, um, whatever, the, whatever the form is, they tend to have broader networks. The reason for this, in part, is that people who are narcissistic are very good at having shallow relationships, and they're good at promoting themselves a little bit. So something like Facebook is going to be very attractive to, you know, you can present the best, you can present the best image of yourself. Um, we've looked at this in different ways. You find, again, narcissism is linked to a number of people. People who are narcissistic present themselves more positively. We've done research on selfies as of other people and find that people who are narcissistic take more selfies. Again, selfies are totally normal. If you're taking selfies, nothing wrong with you. But it just for me, I take selfies. And I mean, it's, it can be a little nerve wracking. I'm just not that attractive. If I were more narcissistic, it would be more pleasant because I'd, I'd enjoy it more. Um, so, so social media is something really appealing for narcissism. It doesn't seem to create narcissism as much as a way, uh, a, be a place where people can reinforce their own narcissism. For people who aren't narcissistic, social media is often sort of threatening because of all the judgment and all the social comparison. Um, another area that gets a lot of attention with narcissism is leadership. And... It, leadership is a lot like love in a way in that the people you fall in love with and the people you should be in relationships with are often different. Same thing with leadership. The people we want to be the leader and the people who are good leaders are often different people. In, in the research and business organizations, they talk about it as emergent leadership and effective leadership. So some sorts of people are really good at emerging as leaders or becoming leaders in groups and other people are effective once they're leaders. So here's what you find with narcissism. Um, people who are narcissistic, especially the more grandiose forms, are, are emerge as leaders in groups. I can bring a, you know, 10 people in a lab and what, if I did this enough times, what I'll find is the people who are narcissistic rise into leadership positions you can go outside of the lab and look at companies and you find that people who are narcissistic rise to leadership. You look in, at politics and it's not too hard to see, but people who rise to leadership are narcissistic. You can look in the priesthood and people who become uh, pastors of larger churches are more likely to be narcissistic. 
it, not all leaders are like this by any means, but the issue with leadership is this leadership is an opportunity for a person to get status and power and access to stuff. So people who are narcissistic want a shot at it. And so whenever you go out there and select for leaders, you're going to pull for narcissism. Um, narcissism for leadership isn't always bad it's typically a trade-off it can be good if your organization is terrible if your organization is good narcissistic leadership can be a disaster um so it's a it's a it's very much a double-edged sword and i'm happy to talk about it just a, there's a lot of there's a lot of um a lot of work on it it really depends what you want in a leader um so it's another good area that we've looked at. This is one that's a little less um, thoughtful, but or less uh, less thought about. But people are, you know, think about narcissism in social media, and they think about narcissism in media. And there's been research on celebrities and reality television stars, and they, you know, those groups tend to have a little higher narcissism scores. Again, not everyone; just the averages tend to be higher. Dr. Drew uh, from the show Love Lines that used to be on MTV gave the narcissistic personality inventory to a large group of celebrities and just looked at the scores. It was very interesting. You'd find high scores in reality television, um, somewhat high scores in stand-up comedy, lower scores in music, because you have to be with a band typically, um, which was, which was kind of interesting. But there's this other area that is less understood, which is geek culture. So I had a graduate student who's very interested in these sort of um, complex cultures that involve, they, they involve science fiction and anime, uh, British, you know, television like Doctor Who, cosplay. Um, and so there are these big conventions like Dragon Con and Comic Con where they study geek culture. And, you know, we did research in those groups and you find in, in some of these, um, some of these, these geek groups, you find high levels of narcissism. You find other things as well, like a lot of creativity. You find, you find some depression or some, some, really some low self-esteem, but you also find grandiose narcissism in part because it's an opportunity to stand out and create an identity and be popular within a group. So that's, that's one of those areas of narcissism research that's a little ours and uh and, and that's where they, they they tend to find it but but narcissism uh, tends to be in a lot of places um in terms of the big questions people can ask and i'm running out of time but in terms of the therapy big questions if you're dealing with somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder or you're suffering from it or even a high level of narcissism that might not be a disorder but it's disruptive to a relationship um, and people wonder can you change narcissism or is there something you can do about it and what we found in the last 10 20 years of personality science is that personality can change people's personality changes across the lifespan in some ways that are sort of predictable and but people can change in their own individual ways um narcissism for example is highest in adolescent males i mean my narcissism was was much higher when i was 18 than i am now even though i actually have a little bit of success now and i had very little back then um but part of that is you know youth and and uh you, you know it, anyway a lot of reasons why young people are are somewhat self-centered and i think it's age appropriate in a lot of ways um so personality does seem to change there is no uh, gold standard treatment for narcissism there's different therapies that have been used um, some that are more cognitive behavioral some that are more psychodynamic some that focus more on relationships some that are more behavioral some that are group they all seem to have some success, at least anecdotally with narcissism. The biggest challenge is getting into treatment. So you imagine you want to change yourself. You have to be motivated to change. You have to say, I want to change. And, um, and then you have to you know, go through the process with people who are narcissistic. Even when there's the desire to change, it can be somewhat hard. If you're depressed, it's hard to change. But imagine if you're 
narcissistic and you kind of like who you are and you're changing for someone else. It, it's hard. So the, the biggest challenge are really these dropout rates. Um, but again, there's, there's evidence that people can change and there's evidence in some of our research that there's a desire to change, that people see, you know, people who are narcissistic see that being self-centered, it might help them in some ways, but it can interfere with their ability to have relationships. And that's a, that's a problem. And so people have some desire to fix. So anyway, I, I hope I covered a whole lot of territory and enough room for questions if people want to ask them. And I'm happy to uh, to see what comes up. Thank you for that brief overview, Dr. Campbell. That was very, um, very a nice base level of understanding narcissism. I think sometimes we have a negative view only of narcissism. Um, when people talk about it, um, we don't really also think about how we could harness narcissism sometimes for more beneficial things to society. I also, for, I did read your book, and I did think the um, discussion of geek culture was really interesting from a perspective because it, it is something that you really wouldn't normally associate um, that trait with. I would normally think of more quiet, introverted people. Yeah. Um, so we do have some questions that are going to come in. Um, so yes, if you do have questions, please leave um, a question in the Q&A down below. We'll let a few questions come in. Well, that's happening. Dr. Campbell, with all of your years studying narcissism, have you d been involved in any interesting studies that you would like to share or what study has always had the most fascinating results for you? Kelsey, you just cut it out at the very last second. Oh, no. Okay, hold on. Give me one second. Um, Dr. Keith, are you there? You're back. Yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, technology. I'm so sorry, everybody. No. Technology. This is how this goes. Um, I was just saying, we have some questions coming in, but briefly, would you like to, because you've had so many years of research with narcissism, do you have a favorite study or something that's always had the most surprising results that you like oh, to share? There's, there's so many just kind of cool studies out there that, that, you know, I kind of would, would geek out on. One of my favorites was looking at attractiveness. So there's this idea that people who are narcissistic are just more attractive. And if you're kind of hot, you can be a little bit of a jerk and people put up with it. And so they've looked at photos and we've looked at this and other people and it turns out, yeah, people who are narcissistic seem a little more attractive in the pictures. Mm -hmm. then, so then somebody said, well, but maybe that's just how they take care of themselves. Maybe it's not the people. What if we had everyone come in and take off their makeup and put something over the hair and shave their beards and take photos that way? And so they did this with a group of undergraduates. I think this was at Georgia Southern, but I'm not positive. And took photos and the effect went away. So the idea is that some of this, this attractiveness of, of people who are narcissistic is really, it's put on. It's, it's, it's something that's, that they want to do to look good. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, it's, it's not bad to look good, but it's just something people who are narcissistic make this more important to themselves. And so you see it that way. So I, I like that study. That's fascinating. And there are a lot of really interesting studies cited in your book, too. So for anyone who's interested more in the, sci the scientific approach that you've done, there's a lot of really interesting things. Um, I do have, we have a lot of questions coming in. Are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So we're going to start with Jill. Poor Jill. Jill wants to know what happens if you work with a narcissist that is your superior. How do you <laughs> deal with a jerk other than leaving a company? Yeah. Um, that happens a lot. And what the story you're telling me is you're working with somebody and sometimes, okay, this person's stealing all my ideas and then getting ahead and then they take, you know, then they're firing me or, um, so my advice, which are my suggestion, I hate giving advice is first of all, keep records of everything to protect yourself. Because this, what happens is you get somebody who's going to steal your ideas or manipulate you or tell you one thing, but then tell something, somebody else to the people at HR. So keep records as much as you can. Build some sort of allies in the company around this person. If this person is that narcissistic, you're not the only one who knows that. So build some sort of allies. 
And the other thing you can do, which is, again, not advice, but something that you might consider is just manipulating the person. So people tell me I'm awesome. It makes me feel good. If I were really narcissistic and I found somebody who all the time told me how great I was, told me I was a legend, what a great boss I was, I'd like that, that person around. So one way of manipulating narcissistic leaders is just sucking up to them. And it's very common. You can see it all the time at your workplace. Go look at a narcissistic boss and they'll have a few people that are just following them all the time. I'm not saying to do it, but you've got a mortgage to pay. Maybe it's something to consider. Well, hopefully Jill can, if Jill is uh, working with a narcissist, hopefully she can use some of that to help her uh, without having to run out the door. Um, let's see. Sue has a very interesting question. What happens if two narcissists get together? That's a, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, we've, we've studied the relationships a long time and, and there's this, this question of mismatch. And I wish I could give you a perfect answer. I just don't have enough data to tell you. But what, what seems to happen is when you find couples or partners that are both narcissistic, it seems to work a little bit better because they, this is why I'm not... I'm not going to say this is rocket, rock solid data. I'm just saying this is looking at a bunch of data and just sort of guessing. Um, because you have two people that are sort of shallow and materialistic and they have similar interests and maybe they're both ambitious and they're into the same things and it kind of works. Where I see the biggest problems is you have two people going into a relationship, one who's shallow, narcissistic, one is somebody who's wants to have a deep emotional commitment with somebody who they find really charming and attractive. And once that relationship starts to go, the person starts looking for the emotional commitment and it's not there and they get hurt because they're saying the commitment's there. It should have been there. Where is it? And so that's where I see a lot of the damage. I mean, we, the way we pick relationship partners in this country is nuts. We find like somebody charming and hot. And then you know, we guess we meet them on Tinder and then we're like, okay, where's that emotional intimacy and commitment? Well, you don't see that on Tinder. You're not going to see that for a while. So that's what happens in these relationships is this, anyway, the problems with narcissism often come, come up later. And I'm assuming, too, that it might be different dynamics if it's two grandiose narcissists versus a grandiose narcissist and a vulnerable narcissist. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because the insecurity in that case, I think, could be a real trouble. I think the key would be that that more that higher level of grandiosity would be better. And the vulnerability, vulnerability and insecurity is just something in relationships that leads to problems, that, even if it's not just narcissism, but, just, you know, yeah, I mean, I've been there. You get in a relationship, you're like, do you love me? Do you love me? It's not a turn on for anyone. So right. I think when you get, you know, that, that vulnerability can have a problem too. Right. So Robin's really interested in the roots of narcissism. She wants to know, are there some types of upbringing that are more likely to produce narcissism? What we find is that with narcissism, like most personality traits, there's a pretty good chunk of heritability in there. There's no narcissism gene. Uh, it's not how personality seems to work, but there's something that you get from your parents. It's probably genetic, probably a whole lot of genes interacting in ways we don't understand. In terms of parenting, the effects seem much weaker than, th than any genetics, but what we find, the general pattern is that people who are more grandiose report that their parents maybe put them on a pedestal, thought they were a special child, maybe they were a little bit spoiled, um, didn't have as much discipline. And the kids who are more vulnerable end up with the more cold and maybe dismissive parenting, the more uh, cold avoidant attachment, just the more classically problematic parenting. But it's a, this is something that gets lost on in a lot of this discussion is that parents, you know, Trauma when you're a kid can lead to lots of problems. One of those problems can be narcissism or even narcissistic personality disorder, but it's not specific in any way. So when you, when you say like, so when I look at the data, if I find somebody with a personality disorder, chances are they had some childhood trauma that go along with that. But if I find somebody with trauma, it doesn't mean they have a personality disorder. It doesn't seem to work that direction. And it's not really specific to narcissism. 
if that makes sense. So when I say there isn't really a relationship between trauma and narcissism too much, it doesn't mean trauma is a good thing. It just means it's not really specific to narcissism. It just does more general damage to people. Right. And you kind of go in that a little bit more with your book too. And you start talking about like the dark triad, if I'm correct, when there's yeah. the other traits. Yeah, the which, dark triad is, oh, I, you want me to? Oh, if you would like to, because actually someone would like to know the relationship between narcissism and borderline personality disorder, which you kind of talk about in that section. Yeah, so that, I, I mean, I'll, I'll do this uh, quickly. There's, um, so what happens with these personality traits is they all are linked. I think of them as cousins or, you know, they're all connected in a way because they share foundational traits. So with narcissism, people often talk about a dark triad of traits. There's nothing magic about a triad. It's just a popular configuration. So that dark triad is a combination of grandiose narcissism, psychopathy, you know, the, the more, which you see more in kind of the Hannibal Lecter type criminal psychopathy, and a trait we call Machiavellianism, which is, a, which is it comes from the prince, you know, the book Machiavelli. I mean, the book, Mach Machiavelli's book, The Prince, I shouldn't say, I feel so embarrassed I'm in a library screwing that one up. But Ma Ma Machiavellianism is a, really about manipulativeness. So in Game of Thrones, they have a lot of these characters like Littlefinger who are kind of classic Machiavellian characters. So all those traits go together because they share this core of antagonism. So what about borderline personality disorder? Well, what borderline personality... Uh, disorder looks like is it really looks like vulnerable narcissism more where you have some of this interpersonal callousness but you have a lot of neuroticism a lot of anxiety and emotional instability with borderline personality a lot of I mean difficulty in emotion regulation but it seems to be a little different from narcissism in that with borderline there's more impulsivity so classic impulsivity like um you know, cutting behavior would be more extreme, but maybe an eating, dysregulated eating, dysregulated, um, I don't know, exercise sometimes. I think more of that might be eating, but eating's one, cutting, there's others. So there's more dysregulation with borderline that you than you would see with narcissism, but there's certainly related traits. And if you go back in the clinical literature, they talk about them as very similar, but I'll leave it at that. That makes absolute sense. Um, thank you for explaining all of that. We do have some people that are interested in potentially helping narcissists. So, for example, Sue, these are kind of related, so I'll say both. Sue in the chat wants to know, what is usually the first clue that someone you meet is a narcissist? And similarly, Laura wants to know, how can you tell someone they're a narcissist in order to help them understand they have a problem? Um. Both, both really good questions. The, the narcissism, uh, honestly, when I find people I really like who seem really charming, charismatic, I get that's a red flag for me. I'm not saying it should be for you, but it's just, it's hard to detect really grandiose narcissism. And I often find when I really like people, I just slow it down a little bit. Um, the other thing I always say this is when you when you meet somebody, it's hard to know their personality straight off. It's just hard to tell, especially with people who are extroverted and likable. So the most important thing to do is get a track record of people or a history or a relationship resume or whatever you want to call it and see what kind of past they have. People who are narcissistic will have bad relationships that they've left behind them at work. They will have cheated people at work. They will have cheated relationship partners. Um, so you'll see some of that as well. You know, if you, if you want to look just at cues, you can look at, you know, grooming and materialism and talking about themselves and charm and look at how people treat you versus how they treat the staff. That's something I look at. You know, how do people treat people that don't have power? Um, so there's a little key cues but there's nothing super diagnostic about them without really looking at the history in terms of change and confronting people um if you tell somebody they're narcissistic that can lead to some defensiveness because it's not something you want to hear i mean i can hear it because it's like i do this for a living it's like you're a little narcissistic i'm like okay i can live with that but if it's not something you're comfortable with you don't use psychological terms that's a little intense 
So what I suggest is perhaps thinking about the specific issues that are causing a problem. Often with narcissism, what you'll find is somebody being a little bit confident and maybe overconfident and driven and overambitious isn't that bad if they're actually a nice, caring person. The problem with narcissism is often that they're, explo they're exploitative, uh, they man they're manipulative. If it, comes to, if it comes between you and the narcissist, they pick it themselves. And so it's those interpersonal things that really hurt. So what I would suggest is if your problems are really interpersonal, then, you know, I just wish you, you know, I wish we had more emotional connection in our relationship. I think that'd be great. I wish you were more loving with the kids. I think focusing on that level um, directly and as behaviorally as you can, rather than making an ego threat, make it a behavioral intervention is better. And the other thing to do with people is one thing you could say, hey, Keith, you kind of suck. Don't suck. I'm like, that's nice. Or you could say, hey, Keith, I, I like you, but would be, you know, what would be really great is if you were even more engaged with your kids, because I think, I think you'd be even a better parent. People would respect you even more than they already do. And they respect you a lot because you're pretty awesome. And, and I'm going to say, you know what, you're right. I'm pretty awesome, but I could be even more awesome if I were more loving and more engaged. And so frame, the way you frame things in a little less threatening way might be useful. Again, depending on the person, but just things to think about. Definitely would have to proceed with a little caution, it seems like. And it would also probably depend, too, on what type of relationship you have versus especially like if it's a colleague or like it's, you know, one of your subordinates at work versus like an inter like marriage or something like that. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we can dabble in this a little bit. We do have some questions regarding politics. We don't have to get super political. And the one I actually do know the answer to because you do talk about in your book. Um, it's a two-parter, kind of. So someone, first of all, wants to know your view of narcissism in the political sphere. And someone also would like to say, wants to know, lots of psychologists are saying Trump is a narcissist. What is your opinion? And if so, what type of narcissist is he? So um, I'm going to, so that I can answer this. I'm going to just answer this from the science because I, I, people, when you start talking about politics, get crazy right now. And that includes me. And I really don't want anyone to be crazy. So I'm just going to say this is what we did. So um, Trump, Trump's personality profile is sort of classically narcissistic. And again, I don't mean this as to, I'm trying to drive anyone away, but just, I mean, I did my dissertation on trophy partners and Trump is kind of the legend for having the trophy spouses. And then I just, he just larger than life showman, you know, personality. The, the question is really what kind of narcissism I think. And so what we did is a study where we got uh, several hundred people. I'm not, I think 150 at least uh, Clinton supporters and Trump supporters. And this is a few years ago and we had them rate, uh, Trump on his personality using a very fine grained personality instrument called the facets of the big five. So it's 30 personality facets. I won't go into it, but what that allows you to do is once you get those ratings, you can convert those into things like narcissism. And so we had people do that. And it turns out that people who support Trump and people who don't support Trump both see Trump as pretty narcissistic guy. They just see him that way. He has a bold, big personality, can be kind of a jerk, and he's self-promoting. But there's a big difference. People who support Trump see him as competent and, and pro, uh, I guess altruistic would be a way to put pro the country and pro them. So he's a good guy who knows kind of what he's doing, although he is brash and bold and larger than life and can be kind of a jerk. People who don't support Trump see him as out of control, um, very impulsive, and very self-centered. So he's narcissistic, but he's particularly unhinged and out of control, and he's only doing it for himself. So what you have is you have two groups of people saying somebody who's largely the same, but one person sees a good guy and one person sees a bad guy. That's, that's kind of what it is, but they're both narcissistic. I mean, they're both views. In terms of 
politics, we've done research because we have these same types of data collected on uh, presidents from the past. Historians have rated the presidents on these personality traits. And what we found is that certain presidents come across or are rated as very narcissistic. The most narcissistic is probably Lyndon Johnson, or I think would be probably more narcissistic than Trump. The other ones that pop up are Nixon, JFK, Clinton, uh, Reagan a little, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and FDR both pop up pretty high. And if you go way back, Andrew Jackson. So there's some of these ones that pop up. People like Richard Nixon are very high in vulnerable narcissism, you know, the paranoia and the craziness. And people like uh, LBJ are much more aggressive and hostile and much more grandiose. Um, but what you find with uh, narcissistic presidents is they're more likely to be unethical, they're more likely to be impeached, and they're also more likely to be great. <laughs> so it's a total trade-off. And so when people look at Johnson, you're like, yeah, that guy's kind of a horrible human being who got a whole lot done. And, um, and, so that's, and so leadership is a weird domain where horrible people can be good leaders and good people can be terrible leaders. And in the case in the US, Jimmy Carter is one of the lowest narcissism scores of presidents. He's from Georgia. He seems he's a wonderful guy from everybody I know because they can go down and he teaches Sunday school. But no one thinks about Carter's a great leader because he's too damn nice. So it's a trade off with a lot of this stuff. And obviously, that doesn't just apply to the United States. Like, there are plenty of probably world leaders, too, that oh. you could think of. Yes. Putin? I mean, <laughs> I mean it, no, I, I, this is something, you know, narcissism, people are narcissistic, want to be leaders, and they're willing to do it. And, and so you see this pop up in a lot of places. Sometimes they talk about as strongman leaders. They got really popular in a lot of places, but... You know, I always talk, you know, Justin Trudeau, north of the border, most loving guy, seems like a really loving dude, but, you know, he's not afraid to take his shirt off at any second's notice, you know, and he got elected taking selfies. I mean, really, that was his campaign. Right. Uh, nothing against him, you know, it's politics or politics, but this is something you see a lot in leaders. That's really interesting. Thank you for providing the science behind that, too. So it's very interesting about like how perspective also plays a big role, too, and how you would view that as a positive or a negative trait. But you did not just mention selfies with Putin. And I do have a question uh, from April in the chat about selfies. So we can segue easily that way. Perfect. April would like to know, she says she's heard that there's that it said it seems like narcissism is increasing and that you mentioned selfie culture and how this might change us. Do you think that rates of narcissism are in changing, whether increasing or decreasing, or that the trait is relatively stable and we're just talking about it more? So uh, we've looked at this a lot, but our data run out about five years ago. So uh, up until 2008, narcissism had been going up and this is, I should preface this, we study college students because those are the people we have narcissism questionnaires for. So this is very limited in our samples. College student narcissism had gone up from the 80s to 2008. Um, it looks like after the Great Recession, it started going down to about 2015. And I haven't looked since because we had never got that paper published and I got so frustrated <laughs> I lost track. And the other thing that happens, we started seeing these spikes in depression. And especially with, uh, with girls and women, but it was a young people in particular. And that started about 2013, which is a different topic than my book. I'm just going to speculate here because I've done some work on that. When, when selfie started, I think it was something very positive for people because it allowed you to show yourself and there weren't all the negative consequences. Once that took off, every young girl, including my daughters, taking selfies ended up with all the issues that all celebrities have. Am I attractive enough? Am I getting enough attention? How is my nose? And then you found that plastic surgeons were doing plastic surgery because people thought their noses were too big because you, know, you always get the perspective wrong with your selfie camera. And 
people started getting depressed and they started moving away from Instagram to fake Inst or whatever, F Instagram accounts that they wouldn't show. And then they started moving to Snapchat that would go away quickly. And then they started moving to TikTok where they just dance and sing nonsense. And so it seems like some of this social media that was really popular to everyone at first has turned some people away, but I'm speculating here. I just, I want to be totally straight. I wish I had data on this for the last five years. I just don't. It seems that that has turned people away to some extent so that we have people who have dominated social media, so-called influencers. Um, but a lot of people I think are a little bit more shy than they might've been. I could be wrong. It just seems that way. Are you familiar, um, this is actually just me asking this, but are you familiar with like face tuning and the prevalence and rise of face tuning for Instagram that's been occurring, especially with influencers? No, but tell me about it because I want to know. Tuning, it's almost it. like Photoshop. It's, it's really sad. So it's apps you can download then that make you look skinnier and really removes and smooths your skin. And people will use it to make parts of them larger and parts of them much smaller. A lot of, um, there's even like a Reddit called Instagram Reality where they will look at um, pictures that are so facetuned and explaining that. And there's a lot of correlation between like the rise of influencers and using these types of things like saying that this is what you need to look like, this is what your body should look like, and how it's been affecting people. So I was just wondering, like, has there been any science or any research with that? No, because the last study we did was Instagram, and we, we looked at the use of filters and found that people more grandiose were just not that into it because they thought they looked pretty good to start with. Mm -hmm. um, and then we couldn't get access to those data anymore, and that was the end of it. So I don't know about face. You want to keep looking. Some of the major celebrities, like even Kylie Jenner and Kardashians and, like, big top Instagram influencers, the ones with, like, millions and millions of followers, have been caught face tuning. So you should look into it. I will, because what that does is it, it messes up for everyone. It's just like Photoshop did and teeth whitening and plastic surgeries. They're setting the norms to be impossible. And then mm -hmm. all, all the kids are going, I want to look as hot as Kylie Jenner. And I'm like, she's rich and is face-tuned. You can't <laughs> be face-tuning. Right. Okay. New, I'm going to face-tune. I'm into this. Oh, it's really interesting to see because, you know, like it looks bad because if you have like a patterned wall, the patterned wall all of a sudden is distorted behind uh -huh. you. And so it's, it's really easy to notice it once you've been trained to like what to look for. So okay. I highly recommend that, though, because I think that that's the, the future, tuning. especially with kids. Thank you. Okay, so we do have some, uh, you know, family-related narcissism questions, which I, I thought we would have, and we did talk about this a little bit before we went live, so we'll go through some of these. Bernadette says that she was married for 20 years to a severe narcissist who was so narcissistic he did not feel he was ever wrong, so no therapy worked for him. Is there some narcissist who cannot change? Oh, I, you know, I... I the word can, I hate, but uh, there's certainly people who are super resistant to change. I mean, that's what you, it's not even just some, it's a lot. I mean, in some of the dropout rates in some of these studies are up to 60%. So I think that resistance to change is, is um, it's very prevalent with narcissism. And, and, and some of the clinic, and I, I should, I'm a researcher, you know, I, I just do science. I don't, I, there's a lot of great clinicians out there. And I listen to them, and, and this is something they talk about a lot. But, this, but these stories of, you know, just you can't get people into therapy or to stay in therapy have been around forever. Big issue. Gotcha. Someone also wants to know, can you talk a little bit about the narcissism wound? This is a term I've heard a lot, too, from people who um, are recovering from narcissistic parents or abusive relationships with narcissistic individuals. This person says, my brother has three tendency Wait. Is some spellings in here. Here is this person. They have a brother that has tendencies into rage and perceived offense. And has ended several relationships with family and friends as a result. So, would you be able to talk a little bit about the narciss narcissism wound and how someone? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting term. So sometimes we say somebody has a narcissistic wound or an ego wound. And it's and you, this is kind of classic vulnerable narcissism, but there's a certain spot where you get you get hit, your ego gets triggered, um, and you can you can lose, you can become enraged and, and sort of uh, and and reactive to this. 
And so the triggers with narcissism are often ego threat, like you're not as important as you think, or I don't love you as much as I think, or you can't do what you want, or you're not, you know, or re rejection, kind of the, the classic OJ thing. Um, but those are, those are the families of triggers usually with narcissism, uh, with these narcissistic wounds. In terms of, of, of healing something like, like that, I mean, that's, that's kind of the nice thing about that is it's a, it's a trauma that you can go in and, and deal with if, you, if you're willing to sit with it. Um, and in terms of uh, narcissism, it's, again, something you see with vulnerability, but it's not, a, it's, not a, um, it's not always a feature of grandiosity. So people who are grandiose are, are, are defensive. I mean, they tend not to be, I mean, they tend to be defensive more, but that real wounding you're talking about that triggers that real rage is not something you always see. That's something more vulnerable. Gotcha. All right. Some people are looking for some very direct tactics, maybe some best uh, caught, like best ways to approach some specific scenarios, which you talked about a little bit earlier, but specifically like how um, do you have any concrete ideas for dealing with a narcissistic family member, such as how to react to racist or misogynistic comments? Is it best to walk away, to engage, to approach them directly? There, I, I mean, I know everyone's hungry to know what to do because, and, and it would be great if, you know, I had this huge grant and a bunch of us have been doing this research. We tried, we just, I mean, I'm kind of speculating at this point. And obviously what you're saying is the problem is, you know, it's like some of the, some of the clinical writing, it's almost like catching a fish. If you, if you're too aggressive, if they snap the line, if you're too loose, they run all over you and you're trying to find that balance. Do I set a boundary? If, if my boundary is too hard, do they become enraged? And then I get in a fight and I don't want to, and I just want to avoid them. And eventually you just go, I want to stay as far away from this person as I can because they're driving me crazy because they don't want to react to them. So, I think what I'm saying is there is no right answer with a, uh, with a single person. What I would suggest, though, and again, this is offer, what I would offer is that rather than doing it piecemeal, especially for the family, is sit down with other people in the family and figure out what you're going to do and what, what your strategy is going to be and where you're drawing the lines and try to be consistent, just like you would be with a child, just like you know, mom and dad with the, with the five-year-old. Maybe the kids would be that way with, with dad. Um, and try to get on the same page and try to support each other and reinforce each other because, because that, that parent or that person is going to take it out on the kid. Any kid who tries to stop the narcissistic parent is going to get their ass kicked. And so the kids need to support each other, I think, so that they can't be singled out and beaten. You know what I mean? You, you need to work together. So maybe that's something to consider. But I, but I, I really, I mean, believe me, I wish I could just say, you know, you, you know, be strong once and then wait two weeks and another super strong or something. But it just, it's just nothing like that. There's no perfect answer. Right. That's completely understandable. It depends on the dynamics and relationship structure of your family. And the power. Yeah. True. Yes. And, you know, sometimes I hate to say it, but we, I have narcissists in my family and sometimes we just had to cut them away, you know, and that, that's hard too. That's a really personal decision, but yes. Absolutely. That's what happens that you cut people off. And, and a lot of it, I should say is, you know, a lot of in relationships, there's this lot of discussion and bluff about where power is. But, you know, if, if there is power in the relationship, there's financial power. You know, this happens with marriage all the time is go get a go get an attorney and figure out what your power is. Please get a really good family attorney and, and take care of yourself and figure that all out. Right. Sounds good. Someone wants to know, maybe this is a parent, um, a parent or someone in the chat would like to know if narcissism can it be recognized in children at an early age or is this something that can only be recognized in an adult and if it is recognized as an early um in an early children is there something that you can effectively do to have it treated or to maybe not cure, obviously but how to mold it so that it's more positive than negative so you can study traits of narcissism in children and adolescents. So we have scales for that. They're self-report scales that sort of work. I shouldn't say so. I mean, they, they seem to work. Um, that said, it's generally risky to, when, when, you, when you start talking about like borderline or narcissism or psychopathy, 
like kids are such narcissistic little psychopaths that, you know, I hate throwing those terms around with them. You know, it's a kid who's, you know, look how awesome I am dancing around with a dress on and then stealing her sister's chocolate cake. I mean, that, that would look pretty, if I did that, you know, it would look clinical. So kids are living in a different world. Um, but we can measure something that looks like narcissism in, in, in younger kids. And if you look at developmental data where they've collected data from really young kids in grade school and follow them until they're 20 or 30, there's consistency. So you see, well, these kids who are maybe seven or eight or a little bit more impulsive are more likely to be a little more grandiose when they're adults. But those, so there's, there's consistency there as a scientist, I think is pretty sweet, but as a parent, I'm not going to sweat it because it's just, it's not that big a consistency. As a parent, I'm not going to really worry about it till my kids older, but um, people always ask for the parenting advice, and so I'm going to give you my simple my simple advice. Just I I hate doing this because it's so simple, but it's it it sort of works. Which is number one is be a good role model for your kid. If you don't want your kid to be a jerk, don't be a jerk. That's good. And then I say CPR. So the three things that are good buffers for narcissism. The number one is compassion or caring. If your kid is compassionate and cares about th people and you, and you encourage that, lo that level of compassion or caring, that's a very important buffer against narcissism. You can be a little bit full of yourself, but if you're a nice person, big deal. The second is passion. This is something we often forget is that if you do things that you love and you're excited about, you can talk about it all day. My daughter could go to dance and have a great time and come home and talk about how great it was. And no one thinks she's narcissistic because she's excited. And it makes me excited. So being passionate, engaged in what you do can allow you to love it and get really good at something and get a lot of praise without getting that real ego involvement. And, and the third is responsibility taking. It's basically just being an adult and taking responsibility for your life, whether you s succeed or screw up. So those are those are kind of the, the those are the little things I think about CPR. Again, none of them is telling your kid, you know, stop liking yourself, stop thinking you're special. You know, you just relax about that, but just be a compassionate, excited, responsible person. You should be okay. Sounds good. So it looks like we have time for maybe one more question this evening. It's I think it's just an interesting one for you personally from background. Barb wants to know what got you interested in narcissism? You've been studying this for quite some time now. So what got you interested in narcissism? Was there something that drew you to it? Yeah, it's, it, I wish it were that exciting of a story, like I was attacked by a narcissistic <laughs> stork or something. But really, um, a couple things. One is the, the issue of ego and and it's something really important to, to our social lives. As a social psychologist in grad school, I noticed this, these, these processes that, you know, people generally overestimate how smart they are and that what good drivers they are and how attractive they are. And they take a little more credit when they succeed. They say they're smart when they fail, they kind of blame the teacher. And so we do all these biases and, and studying narcissism shows you that, well, some people are doing this more than others, kind of boring. The other reason was I was, Sort of, I went, I went to Berkeley, I was sort of into Buddhism and the non-self and self-transcendence and all this stuff. And I, I couldn't figure it out to study the non-self for the life of me. So I did the opposite and studied the over-the-top ego. So you can really see it as kind of interesting. And then, you know, then when I was doing it, then Columbine happened and we we're like, oh my God, look, at this is crazy. These people want movies made of them. They're murdering their friends. And then, you know, Facebook and selfie you know the world just keeps pulling for narcissism because a lot of our economy is driven just by manipulating people's ego i mean that's a huge driver of the economy so i've i've had a life's work um not necessarily i wanted it but it just kept happening i, I didn't ask for it the selfies but so anyway that's that's my story well, I think that's a fascinating topic, and thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much for your research. Um, for everyone in the chat, again, the book is called The New Science of Narcissism. My camera's was kind of shadowing it with the light, but it's a fantastic book. has some really great case studies, everything from Elliot Roger, the one infamous mass killer from early 2014-ish, to 
you know, modern celebrities, Kanye West. You can learn about how you yourself might be a narcissist and how you can change it even. There's all kinds of great info. And again, Learn It All is selling copies of this book. And actually, I forgot to mention earlier, it will be signed. So um, if you do order, um, you can get a signed copy. So again, Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much for your information. Um, it was a pleasure. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. Thank you for all the great questions. That was really interesting. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone for tuning in tonight, Hudson residents and Hudson community. Again, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Everyone have a great evening. Bye. Bye.